Okay, greetings. This is going to focus on chapter 12, spinal cord, spinal nerves, and spinal reflexes. Now, when we talk about the spinal cord, this is part of the CNS, but the central nervous system not only includes the spinal cord, but includes the brain. And the interesting thing about the, the CNS is that what you have is inputs and outputs. Sensory stimuli is brought in. It's carried in by spinal nerves. These are the afferent pathways. This will go in, be, this information will be processed by the CNS, and if something is necessary, you'll get a, what is referred to as a motor output. It'll be carried out in efferent pathways. This is where you will have certain responses to the stimuli. Now, we have a lot of spinal reflex centers that exist and they don't even need the responses uh, being coordinated with the brain. That, just, that being said, spinal cord will function independently from the brain. Um, we have reflexes that are coordinated completely from responses to sensory input, and the response centers are completely located in the spinal cord. What is a reflex? It's a rapid automatic response triggered by a specific uh, stimuli. Now, spinal reflexes are controlled by the spinal cord. They can function without any input, as I've said, from the brain. Although a lot of times spinal reflexes, uh, the neurons there also have usually a collateral that will ascend and go into the brain to make you aware that, hey, this spinal reflex occurred. But you don't have to think about a spinal reflex. It's rapid. It's automatic. You don't even think about this. This just happens. Now, what we're going to be looking at in this chapter is focused on the spinal cord, as well as the nerves and the reflexes. Now, chapter 13 is much more involved, and that's where we're going to deal with the brain, cranial nerves, sensory and motor pathways. But what you have to keep in mind is once you have sensory input coming in for the spinal cord, the output can affect a variety of effectors. And this includes skeletal muscles, smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, as well as glands, and of course, adipose tissue. Let's discuss about the spinal cord for a few minutes. It has 31 segments with 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Uh, the spinal nerves are, in, are basically bundles of axons on the peripheral nervous system uh, that are connected to the spinal cord. So basically the cell body in a lot of cases is located back in the spinal cord itself, but it has these very long axons that stretch out until you get to a particular target organ, or they will synapse with an intermediate uh, neuron, which will then itself be connected to the outside organ, the muscle, whatever. When we talk about these spinal nerves, they're listed by a letter, which represents the vertebral group, and also by a number. Uh, the spinal nerve is identified by its association with adjacent vertebrae. So spi uh, cervical spinal uh, nerves are associated with the spinal, uh, excuse me, the cervical spinal vertebrae. Now, an interesting thing is that we have C1 through 8. Well, wait a minute. I thought we had only seven cervical vertebrae. Yeah, you do. C1 passes between the skull and the first cervical vertebrae. And since there are only seven cervical vertebrae, there really are eight cervical spinal nerves. So these are listed as C1 through C8. Uh, the thoracic, which is T1 through T12. The lumbar, which is L1 through L5. Sacral, which is L S1 to S5. Now, because we have C, we have to designate the coccygeal nerve as CO1. Okay, you want to keep that in mind. Now, there's some important structural concepts here. When we talk about the uh, spinal cord, we have an enlargement of it around the cervical region. Now, this is due to the fact that you have a lot of nerves uh, for the shoulder and the upper limbs. Consequently, you also have an enlargement down, down near the lumbar area. It's also referred to as lumbosacral. And that also processes uh, nerves that are involved with the pelvis and the lower limbs. Obviously, with more uh, tissue and more uh, muscles and other things like that, uh, 
you have to have a corresponding increase in the amount of nerves. So that's why the enlargement exists at the cervical region and at the lumbar region. Now, despite the fact that it's in the lumbar region, it's still located about oh, T11, T12. In part, this is due to the fact that the spinal cord kind of grows along with the growing of an individual. So you get to about age four. Then what happens is the spinal cord doesn't grow any longer. It just extends uh, lengthwise its spinal nerves uh, to compensate for the growing body mass. I hope that makes sense. But basically, as you move from age four to, let's say, 14 or age 24 or 44, um, your height is pretty much done by about 24, but the growth of the spinal cord has not really increased significantly since you were four years old. The end of the spinal cord is this conical shaped structure, and it's really below or inferior to the lumbar enlargement. It occurs about L1, L2, and it's called the conus medullaris. Right after it, you have what is called the cauda equina, which basically translates to horsetail, because what happens is when the conus medullaris ends, you have all of these nerve roots that spread out, and it looks like a horsetail. Now, we have what is referred to as the filium termini. This is a thin strand of fibrous tissue that extends from the inferior tip of the conus medullaris to the second sacral vertebrae. This provides longitudinal support uh, to the spinal cord as a component of the coxal geo ligament. Basically, let me just put it to you this way to think about it. So that you don't have the spinal cord itself moving around, you're going to have these certain uh, scaffoldings of connective tissue or fibrous tissue that are going to basically keep it in a certain orientation, in a certain position. Despite running, jumping, slamming up and down all over the place, the body is not going to see the spinal cord move around. And that's good because you don't really want to have that with it leading to the chance of damage to the uh, spinal cord itself. If you look at this diagram, you can see here are the cervical spinal nerves. You have a cervical enlargement, so a lot more of these nerves will travel down into the limbs, the upper limbs. Then you have this lumbrosacral enlargement, which its nerves will eventually process for the pelvic area and the lower limbs. And also, if you notice here, you have the cauda equina, and this is after the conus medullaris, that cone-shaped structure. But in between all of this, you've got this a unique fibrous tissue called the filium termini that's going to keep everything nice and secure. So it's not going to bounce up, bounce down, etc. As for lateral movement, we're going to talk about uh, the denculate ligaments in a little bit. But you can notice as we move from the cervical spinal nerves to the thoracic spinal nerves to the lumbar spinal nerves, sacral down here, and eventually the coccygeal nerve. Okay. Now, I said the spinal cord is divided into 31 segments. We've talked about this. If you look and cut the spinal cord uh, in a transverse cut, what you're going to find is the presence of gray matter and white matter. Now, gray matter is really unmyelinated axons, cell bodies, and neuroglia. Kind of forms sort of an H shape. White matter is heavily myelinated axons. These are outside. Now, this is what I mean by it's a reverse of the brain. In the brain, if you look at the brain from the outside, it's going to have mostly gray matter. That's going to be, again, on myelinated axon cell bodies, neuroglia. When you slice through the brain, you will notice that inside of it, in the uh, cerebrum, for example, you're going to find a lot of white matter there. That's going to be myelinated axons. But this happens to be reverse when you get into the spinal cord. Spinal cord, gray matter is on the inside, white matter is on the outside. Now, there's some spinal cord structures that you need to be aware of. The posterior medial sulcus, this is a shallow longitudinal groove on the posterior, that's the dorsal surface of the spinal cord. Also, you'll notice that there's a posterior, posterior root. This contains axons of neurons whose cell bodies are in the posterior root ganglion. The posterior root ganglion, well, look at, this is bringing in, this is in the afferent pathways, 
with the A, meaning that it will take in sensory information. Sensory neurons carry sensory information. And so what you have is this root ganglion, and uh, that has all the cell bodies. Axons can be very, very long. And in this case, this is what you see. The axons carry information into the spinal cord. Now, the spinal nerves will contain axons of both sensory and motor neurons. So any spinal nerve we talk about has both. It's referred to as mixed nerve, meaning that it contains both sensory and motor neurons. Now, of course, spinal nerves pass through the intervertebral foramen. And then the other structure you need to be mindful of is the anterior root, which contains axons of the motor neurons that extend into the periphery to control somatic and visceral effectors. What? Basically, the anterior root has cell bodies in its gray matter and very long axons that reach out beyond the spinal cord, follow long pathways, go into the peripheral nervous system, and they are going to control somatic, for example, skeletal muscle, and visceral effectors. Visceral could be heart, blood pressure, in other words, controlling the muscles that uh, control the diameter of blood vessels. It may control the secretion of certain glands or may act on adipose tissue. So that's the visceral effectors so as an example. The anterior medial fissure is a much, much deeper groove along the anterior surface. If you look here at this cross-reference here, we have the spinal nerves along here. Notice that there's a big space here. Spinal cord travels down. Eventually, you have lots and lots of these fine nerve rootlets, and they'll come out through the sacral and the lumbar, etc. And eventually, also the coccygeal. Now, the, the purpose of this diagram is to give you several pieces of information. First off, there's gray matter, there's white matter. There's the posterior medial sulcus and the anterior medial fissure, which if you notice, this separation right here is far deeper than this tiny little groove here. The other thing is you have a spinal uh, nerve. Notice that the sensory information will come up toward here to the posterior root ganglia through the posterior root, and it will make connection here into the gray matter. Uh, but notice that the gray matter distribution to a point shifts from segment, let's say, cervical three to th thoracic three to lumbar one, and eventually to sacral two. You have changes in both the amount of gray matter and the amount of white matter. If you look here, white matter here, and white matter not as much there. White matter is going to be the myelinated fibers. They're going to be having what we call ascending and descending pathways. Okay? But keep in mind some of the basics here. Also the central canal. Now, why was there such space around the spinal cord? Well, we're going to talk about this. We have to have some padding, some protection. We have what are referred to as spinal meninges. Now, meninges are really specialized membranes. They surround and protect uh, not only the spinal cord, but the brain. We're going to talk about pia matter, arachnoid matter, and dura matter. You're going to find this uh, mentioned again in Chapter 13 when we talk about the brain. But let's talk about pia matter for the spinal cord only right now. It's a meshwork of elastic, elastic and collagen fibers. They're all tightly bound right to the neural tissue. Pia is like mother meaning it's just wrapped really, really tight and protective. The next layer up is called the arachnoid mater. Now, that's a middle meningeal layer. It just has simple squamous epithelium and a subarachnoid space. The subarachnoid space, this is a space beneath the arachnoid mater, and it has little fine filaments that attach to the pia mater, but in that space is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. That helps in protection for the spinal cord. Dura matter, this is a tuft outermost meninges. It's the outside, and it's really, really tough. It contains dense collagen fibers that range along a longitudinal axis. There is a space between the dura mater and the arachnoid matter. It's called the subdural space. This exists between uh, these areas. We're going to talk about a subarachnoid space, and we're going to talk about CSF a little bit more in a second, but I want you to keep in mind Outermost dura mater, next level down, 
arachnoid matter. Between them is a small area, a pocket. Now, between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter is another. It's called subarachnoid, so below the arachnoid. And this contains uh, the arachnoid trabeculae, which I talked about. And then we have these spaces that are filled with cerebral spinal fluid, which acts as a shock absorber. It's also interesting, it's a medium for transport of gases, nutrients, me uh, chemical messengers like nerve growth factors, and waste. We're going to show how it's really important in some medical applications in a minute. If you take a look at this diagram, you see out here the dura mater. Next layer is the arachnoid matter, and finally the pia matter, right tough up against uh, the spinal cord itself. If you go to the next projection here, there's something else that's very important. Notice that there was a lot of empty space between even the dura mater and the roof here, which would be the vertebral body, and the floor here, which would be sort of uh, part of the vertebral other side of the wall there. And it's filled with adipose tissue because that acts as a type of cushion. Also, you'll notice these lines going from uh, one side and to the other attached to the spinal cord. We're going to get into those because those are extremely important. Those are the denculate ligaments. Now, the spinal meninges continue to protect the spinal cord and actually are longer than the spinal cord itself. There's a space between the epidural, uh, what you might call uh, the, the actual space between the spinal cord and the dura. And this dural matter contains areolar tissue, blood vessels, and adipose tissue. Now, the dura extends beyond the actual spinal cord. And so you have this area that's filled with CSF, but there's no real solid spinal cord. You have some spinal nerves there, but you end up with this large space, usually posterior to, or I should say inferior to, L2. This is known as the lumbar uh, space. They refer to it, if you want to do a procedure, as a lumbar puncture. You may have heard of spinal tap. Now, what happens is this epidural space basically is filled with fluid. You can take a sample of the CSF, and it's supposed to come out like water, because I've seen it actually tapped where the, the anesthesiologist will put in a needle and get into the space, and he can do what is recalled uh, a spinal block, injecting anesthetics. But the other thing he can do is he can take a sample of that uh, cerebral spinal fluid. That's one of the most reliable places to take it. And you can do all sorts of toxic uh, toxin checks. You can do various microbiology checks. In order to look for viruses, bacteria, fungal spores, etc. cetera. Uh, the worst case I've ever heard, and I think I mentioned this in class in the lab, was when somebody did a spinal tap and the stuff came out like buttermilk. Normal CSF looks like water, comes out like water, drips out. It's very, very uh, thin, watery, clear, transparent. So if you've got it coming out like buttermilk, you've got a massive amount of bacteria in there, okay? Now, if you want to, and it happens in some cases, uh, someone will complain that they get a massive headache when they have a spinal tap done. What doctors will do to attempt to seal the leakage as well as reestablish the pressure is take some of the patient's blood and actually inject it into the CSF. This replaces uh, the volume and the, the pressure that was reduced when they did the initial tap. Um, it's very common to see a spinal block, or they may call it an epidermal, uh, for women that are having um, a delivery of a child, okay? So, one more thing, denculate ligaments. Let me get back to that. This basically prevents lateral, side-to-side -side movement of the spinal cord. It consists of extensions of the pia mater. Here are the denculate ligaments. Here, 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 here. They're all on the side, sort of like side attachments. 
And what they did was they pulled and cut away the vertebral roof, the bone itself. And so you can clearly see uh, dura matter here, which is cut and reflected. Um, the arachnoid matter, which is cut and reflected. And what you have are the interior roots, which basically go into rootlets, which basically attach and have their pathways into the spinal cord itself. Pia matter, you can see that layered out here. And so it gives kind of a glistening look. Right underneath is kind of a duller look, and that's the spinal cord itself, okay? Now here on this x-ray, you can see how the spinal cord kind of narrows down to kind of a, uh, a blunt cone-shaped structure. Here, this is where you're going to get actually uh, a sample, a lumbar puncture needle with the tip. Now, what you've got to keep in mind is you've got some of these fibers, nerve fibers coming through. There's a lot of open space here, folks, and it's filled with CSF. So you can basically put in anesthetics, which would create no pain below the point of injection, or you can take a sample of the CSF here. And this is the lowest risk of causing any nerve damage. You can't do it up the cervical region. You can't do it the thoracic. You certainly don't want to do it high on the lumbar area like L1, because you have a risk of actually puncturing or going into the thickened spinal cord. So let's talk about the actual uh, functions of the gray matter and the white matter of the spinal cord. Gray matter integrates sensory and motor function, yeah. White matter is really carrying information. You want information to be traveling fast. That's why it's white, meaning that's why it's myelinated. Remember, myelination results in a faster traveling action potential. So. The interesting thing is we have this H kind of shape. They also refer to them as horns. These are projections of gray matter toward the outer surface of the spinal cord. You have the posterior gray horn, which contains sensory and visceral sensory nuclei. You have the lateral gray horn. Now, this is something you got to keep remembering. You'll see it come back when we deal with chapter 14 on the autonomic nervous system. The lateral gray horn really exists only in the thoracic and lumbar segments and is used to contain what's referred to as visceral motor nuclei. These uh, targets, these effectors for the visceral motor nuclei, mostly just autonomic targets. In other words, how to control the heart rate, how to control digestion, how to control respiratory rate, how to control blood pressure, things like that. Stuff that you don't think about every day. You don't need to, because it's all automatic. The anterior gray horn will contain somatic motor nuclei. Think somatic as skeletal muscle. The gray commissures, these are located on the posterior and anterior to the central canal. Okay, now the central canal, you know, is that little hole that takes and has CSF passed through it. The gray commissures contain axons that cross information from one side to the other before they meet with cell bodies in the gray matter. So here is the gray commissure. Here is the central canal. This up here is the posterior gray horn. You see it over here labeled. So it's taking sensory information in. The lateral gray horn might kind of stick out a little bit here. That's only in the thoracic and lumbar area. Okay. Here, you have that lower part. That's the anterior gray horn. Anterior gray horn is basically going to be sending out uh, axons to the, what we call somatic motor region, which in other ways, as I said before, is skeletal muscles, okay? Why the thoracic and lumbar? Well, we'll get back into this in uh, chapter 14. Basically, what I'm, what I'm trying to get you to think about is this to remember that the lateral gray horns only exist there because that is the place where the uh, sympathetic autonomic nervous system communicates with certain areas of the body, okay? They have these nerves that come out at the thoracic and at the lumbar to a variety of the organs. Also, what you'll notice here is 
dura matter. And they have kind of on this slide sort of a broken up bit of arachnoid matter, which is the next layer. And you can see this thin layer over here and two over here, right at that edge. And that's all pia matter, okay? Of course, you've got the anterior median fissure right there and the posterior mediocelsus, which is very, very uh, shallow right there. And so we're going to talk about the functional organization of the gray matter. We have sensory nuclei, motor nuclei. Uh, we have structural organization of the white matter. Let's talk about these cell bodies for a second. These are ar arranged in a functional groups called nuclei. Now, just to help you, you want to get used to the terms. If you have a large collection of cell bodies and they're surrounded by white matter, then that area is referred to as nuclei. This term you'll see only in the central nervous system, spinal cord and brain. If you see a collection of cell bodies outside the central nervous system, such as in the peripheral nervous system, we will refer to it as ganglia, okay? And you will see this sometimes. Now, sensory nuclei, basically you're receiving and relaying sensory information from the peripheral receptors, whether that's on the skin, whether that's rumbling in my stomach, whether that is uh, uh, from my, well, let's say from my face, I'm getting flush or I'm getting, I'm getting warm or, you know, grandma pinches my cheek way too much, whatever, that's sensory information. The motor nuclei issue motor commands to the peripheral effectors. Remember, peripheral effectors, smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, heart muscle, glands, adipose tissue. What about the organization of the white matter? Now, here's another thing that we have to be mindful of. White matter is on each side of the spinal cord, but these collections of white matter are divided into columns. Each column is divided into bundles of axons that are basically the same, uniform, in information transmitted, diameter, myelination, and propagation speed. We call them tracks. And then we have the posterior white column, which lies between the posterior gray horns and the posterior median sulcus. Now, as you can see here from this diagram, here's again our gray commissure, information passing from one side to the other. Here we have uh, the sensory nuclei. The first part here is going to be somatic, so information from the body. Visceral information internal to the body, rumbling stomach, uh, gas pains, whatever. Now that's all the posterior gray horn. Then we get below that to the lateral gray horn. That's where you're going to have visceral information coming out. You only see that thoracic and lumbar because that's all involved with the sympathetic uh, autonomic nervous system. But the lower part, this kind of pinkish area, that's somatic. So the motor nuclei are here. They have axons that travel out. And what they are doing is communicating to have your, the muscles of your body move around. Okay? So far, so good. So keep in mind, posterior gray horn, lateral gray horn, anterior gray horn. Notice the posterior root ganglion here. This is a collection of cell fibers. They're bringing up sensory information to bring it into the body, to bring it into the spinal cord. An anterior root is going to come out, and this is carrying only efferent pathways, motor information. Now, the lateral white column we've talked about a bit. Let's talk about it again. This includes white matter on either side of the spinal cord. The anterior white column lies between the anterior gray horns and the anterior median fissure. What is its functions? Well, you're going to have, depending on where you take your sample of your spinal cord, ascending and descending tracts. Sometimes you have both. Okay. What are you communicating with? Well, if you're going up the spinal cord, you're going to have carrying sensory information to the brain. If you're having descending tracts, that's carrying motor commands to the spinal cord and then out to the rest of the body. It may be carrying it all the way up from the brain. Now, the organization of tracts in the posterior white column, they contain ascending tracts that carry sensations from the limbs and the trunk. Okay, 
So here we have this, we have these columns. The posterior white column is here. The lateral white column is here. So it's easy to think. Remember, posterior, lateral, anterior. Just like you had the posterior uh, sensory fibers or the, the cell clusters up here, the posterior horn, the lateral horn, the anterior horn, okay? Keep in mind, notice this. The organization of the tracts of the posterior white column. Leg, hip, trunk, arm. So they kind of spread outward. Obviously, these pathways are going to go right back up into the brain. They're going to provide for you sensory information. Oops, I stepped on a tack. Oops, uh, I've got an itch on my hip. Oh, I burned myself when I, when I went out and suntanned myself, and now my trunk of my body is all red and blistered and all that terrible stuff. Or on my arm, there was a bug. It was a mosquito, and, it's, and it bit me, and it itches. Now, here, the motor nuclei. So you've got trunk, shoulder, arm, forearm, and hand. All of this is going to control the muscles. Now, some of these columns um, may also carry other information, either ascending or descending or both. Now, there's one thing you have to keep in mind. Uh, spinal nerves have a similar structure and distribution pattern. So what is going to be a pattern of spinal nerves in you and in me is basically the same. That's why we can basically uh, look upon medicine and look upon anatomy and physiology as a lot of similar things that occur, okay? But let's take a look at an individual spinal nerve because we're going to have a lot of very important components in it. Now, spinal nerves, we know, in essence, are an organ because they contain multiple tissues. Spinal nerves contain connective tissue, axons, and blood vessels. They also have different connective tissue layers, okay? Now, some of the nerve fibers in there the, are axons that have myelin sheets as well. You've seen this mentioned in lab. You'll see it again in this diagram coming up. The layers of the connective tissue include the epineurium, the perineurium, the endoneurium. Now, the epineurium is the outermost. It surrounds the entire nerve. And what's going to be going on there is you've got a lot of bundles of axons. And these are referred to as nerve fascicles. To contain them, you're going to have connective tissue that surrounds the nerve fascicle called the perineurium. And then you have an individual connective fiber sheath that surrounds just the axon, just individual axons. Okay? Now, when they cover individual axons, I just want you to be aware of this too. You can see sometimes the axon inside. Sometimes there's a space which suggests that there was um, a space between the axon itself and the endoneurium. That may indicate that there was myelination for that particular axon. When we have branching in nerves, we refer to them as rami or ramus. Okay. So here we have this uh, connective tissue layers. The outermost layer is epineurium. It basically contains everything inside. We have nerve fascicles. To contain them, we have perineurium. Notice that in this entire nerve structure, we've got veins, arteries, etc. And then we have an individual nerve fiber that's part of this fascicle, and it's covered by endoneurium. Now, the endoneurium is outside of whatever, if it's a myelinated axon, it's going to basically have the Schwann cells, and then you'll have the layer of endoneurium. I bring this up because it's very important how things are arranged, okay? So, epi, peri, endo. When I talk about rami, I said it was a branch of a nerve. Well, there are various branches that come off once you leave the spinal cord. The dorsal primary ramus supplies the deep back muscles and skin on the dorsal surface of the trunk. That's why we call it the dorsal primary ramus. The ventral primary ramus supplies uh, nerves to structures on the limbs, 
skin along the lateral and ventral surfaces of the trunk, and skeletal muscles except for the deep back muscles. Remember all those deep back muscles? You've got to go back over them. And then we have another unique structure that's found called the rami communicantes. This is present in areas from T1 to L2. Hmm, there was something familiar about that before. Yeah, that has something to do with the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, we're going to be, and that's not a typo, ANS stands for Autonomic Nervous System. We're going to have to get used to that one too. But the rami that play a role here play a role containing axons from the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. Uh, these are going to have the spinal nerves in the thoracic and upper lumbar sections. They're going to carry motor output from the sympathetic division. The sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system is also referred to as the fight or flight. This is involved in getting you ready in case you have to go battle or flee a predator. Okay. Now, here you can see our spinal cord. Here you see our posterior root ganglion coming in, and then the anterior root coming out. So the anterior is the efferent pathways carrying motor information. The posterior root is carrying afferent pathways, bringing sensory information in. Forms a spinal nerve. Then it has the branching. Now, the posterior ramus is going to handle one particular set of details anterior will handle the other, and you see this, the sympathetic ganglion and the rame communicantis existing only where there would be sympathetic autonomic nervous system, which is basically T1 through L2, okay? Now we're going to start dealing with something else called dermatomes. I mentioned this in uh, class and lab. These are divisions of the sensory cutaneous regions of the body, innervated by a single pair of spinal nerves. So in other words, if you look at your hand, it's not all innervated by a single pair of spinal nerves. Actually, it's several different ones. Now, C1 lacks skin or innervation, and there are a couple of those little fuzzy little, you know, exceptions to the rule. Adjacent dermatones on the trunk are going to have some overlap, okay? So it depends. Individuals who have slight variations, but it's not like someone is going to sit there and say, well, my hand is controlled by just purely, you know, this nerve and this nerve, whereas others are going to have just this nerve and this nerve. It's just a slight variation. The face is monitored by the cranial nerve CN5. Remember, it has a Roman numeral after it. And so we'll get into CN5 when we get into cranial nerves chapter 13 when we deal with the brain because we're going to deal with brain and cranial nerves. Now there is another important thing I want you to be aware of, shingles. That actually comes from the Latin singulum which refers to girdle or girdle. Now you might think of girdle as a, gar uh, uh, a garment but I want you to think about this for a few minutes. Shingles is caused by the same virus that causes chickenpox, the herpes zoster virus. Okay now what happens actually is this. An individual may have been exposed to the virus when they were young as a chicken pox victim. The chicken pox virus will, will settle into certain nerves and kind of stay there dormant. It will eventually reactivate under stress or suppression of the immune system. A lot of times it shows up as people are getting older because their immune system is not as active as it previously was. When the virus is reactivated, it will attack neurons on the posterior root of the spinal nerves and the sensory ganglion of cranial nerves. That's why you're going to see sometimes patients uh, suffering from shingles, not merely in their, the trunk of their body, but on their face, because some of those cranial nerves get attacked, and that's going to be a painful rash and blisters. It's a painful rash or blisters wherever it is. A lot of times it's going to correspond to the area innervated by that spinal sensory nerves and the dermatome. A vaccine does exist, and usually patients that are over 50 are, are basically encouraged to get it, but I want to warn you about something. A couple things I found out recently, just in review. One, you don't get one shot. you got to get two, okay, okay, after a short period of time. Uh, so... And in this area at present, at this present day, a lot of uh, doctor's offices are complaining that they don't have enough. 
see, they have to keep two doses per patient. First dose they give to the patient, and the patient has to come back, I don't know if it's 30 or 60 days later. So they've got to have the other one ready. Now, the only other means to help a patient suffering from shingles is using antiviral drugs, which will stop the viral replication. Now, a couple of other pointers about this shingles. Usually, you'll see it with elderly, immune compromised. Yes, that does include HIV patients or patients on immunosuppressant drugs. If they are pregnant, and part of the reason for pregnancy is because pregnancy, to have a successful development of a fetus, you're going to have to have the mom's immunity tampered down somewhat so the immune system does not attempt to cause uh, the expulsion, the destruction of the developing embryo or fetus. Also, those with cancer, because a lot of times the cancer, immune, uh, the cancer causes immune suppression or the drugs that are involved may damage some of the immune system. Here are the dermatomes as I've shown you. Don't worry, you don't have to memorize every little detail, but I do want you to be aware of them. Notice that they correspond to a point with um, all of the spinal cord nerves. So C2 downward, you've got H1 through, excuse me, T1 to T12, as well as the uh, lumbar. Notice that they have both the anterior and the posterior view here. So on the anterior view, you, you get a lot more innervation by uh, the, the lumbar nerves. But in the posterior, you have a lot more innervation of the lower limbs by the sacral uh, nerves, okay? And here's an example of basically shingles. You can see how it comes down along the body here through a dermatome. You have a painful rash and you have blistering. It follows along basically the pathway of this spinal nerve. Notice that it's not all over the body, like chicken pox would be if you were a kid, etc. Okay, so you want to be aware of this. Okay, where are we now? We're just about at the end. I'm going to stop right here and encourage you to spend some time to review. Oh, no, wait a minute. We've got about eight more minutes. I'm sorry. I take that back. I want to make sure that we get through at least 50 minutes uh, to compensate. I do appreciate, by the way, your patience on this. Let me just continue with the ramus. Now, usually each ramus is going to provide sensory innervation and motor innervation to that specific area. That's where the dermatone is really important. When you talk about the posterior ramus, we've talked about this. It carries sensory information from the skin and the skeletal muscles of the back. The anterior is going to carry sensory information from the ventral lateral body surface structures in the body wall and the limbs. Okay, motor commands, note the innervation targets. And we've talked about this a little bit before. Posterior ramus contains somatic motor and visceral motor fibers that innervate skin and back skeletal muscles. Anterior ramus supply the ventral lateral body surface. When I say ventral lateral, you're talking about the side and etc. and structures of the body wall and the limbs, okay? They're not handling the deep muscles there. Here we have it, okay? Sensory information is going in. Basically, motor information is going out, and the motor information going out will either pass straight through here, okay? or it will go out the posterior ramus or the anterior ramus, okay? You've got to keep in mind a couple of other things too. Now, sensory information going in can be from exteroceptors, proprioceptors in the body, wall, and limbs, or interoceptors of the body, wall, and limbs. These are different types of uh, sensory receptors that play a role in you know, is the muscle being pulled? Is there uh, joints being tugged on? Uh, are synapses, excuse me, are ligaments being pulled on? Things like that. You have a variety of sensors that are in um, some of the connective tissue as well as the muscles and the tendons to detect certain strains, etc., as well as provide information about certain positions, etc. Okay, that's the sensory information. In issue 
And we've talked about the white ramus communicantes. That's a short nerve branch that carries visceral motor fibers to a nearby sympathetic ganglia. Remember, it's white, and the reason why it's white, because it's myelinated. The gray ramus communicans is unmyelinated. It's postganglionic fiber. It appears grayish, and that will innervate the smooth muscle and glands. In this one, you're going to basically be providing information to autonomic nervous system. Here, you're going to provide some information to the sympathetic nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, but you may also parry, carry also some other information to uh, some skeletal muscles. Here's the motor command. So this is outgoing information. Notice that this is going to go through uh, basically either the anterior or the lateral uh, horns. If it's lateral horns, it's visceral motor nuclei that comes out, goes through the rame communicantes. Some of it will go down the sympathetic nerve. Some of it will basically synapse here, go back out, okay? Some of this information will go back out directly, as you can see from the blue, if it is somatic motor information. What I'm saying to you is to help you. If you're saying visceral motor, you're probably talking about autonomic nervous system um, wiring. If you're saying somatic motor, you're really saying skeletal muscle is the target, if that helps, okay? Now, last area. Spinal nerves form nerve plexuses that innervate the skin and skeletal muscles. Now, when we have these plexuses, this is a complex of interwoven network fibers. Some of these spinal nerves will converge, and then later on they'll diverge. Some of the convergence, you'll have the anterior rami of adjacent spinal nerves. They'll blend their fibers, producing compound nerve trunks. The anterior rami form four major plexuses. These are important, and yes, you will be, you will need to know them. The cervical plexus, which comes out between C1 and C5. That innervates the muscles of the neck and diaphragm. Brachial plexus, that's between C5 and T1. This innervates the pectoral girdle and upper limb. So just basically follow this with either your dermatome uh, map or even just a basic spinal cord uh, map. The brachial plexus goes from C5 to T1. We've talked about that. The lumbar plexus goes from T12 to L4. That innervates the pelvic girdle and lower limbs. The sacral uh, or, or sacral plexus goes from L4 to S4. That innervates the pelvic girdle and the lower limbs. Remember that the lumbar and sacral are often referred to as lumbral sacral plexus. Okay? So what are you saying? Lumbar and, 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 and sacral? Okay, fine. So they kind of cover the lower parts. You have to have these plexus to deal with extensions beyond the axial if you want to say axial skeleton or axi axial musculature of the body, because you've got limbs, two up, upper ones with its corresponding pectoral girdle, and then we've got the pelvic girdle and the corresponding lower limbs, okay? And you can see this here in this diagram. You'll see where there are going to be some nerves. Now, to help you, the next class we meet I would encourage you to print out one of these charts. You will need to know some of the nerves. It would probably help you if you just also just download and print out the entire PowerPoint slides for this particular area, because you really need to know about a variety of these major nerves, like the radial, the ulnar, the median, because we've been talking about this for some time in one way or another, the phrenic nerve, and we're going to talk about a variety of the, the plexi and the nerves that come off these plexi because they're extremely important. And of course, the biggie, the sciatic nerve going down into the lower limbs. We'll get into this all next time. So what I would encourage all of you to do is take time to review and we'll meet on Friday. Again, thank you very much for your patience as I have a uh, department meeting. And with that, we'll close.